about her experience in the Master's of Education program in higher education. And she tweeted every single lecture she went to, every single academic event, every single uh, non-academic event. Um, those of you who know her, she has a very exuberant personality. So when she left, there was a void in this place because of her communication was gone. And students felt it, I felt it, and so I thought, I'm going to see what this is. Maybe I can somehow do a little bit of what Lorraine was doing. So I began to think about Twitter as part of my academic profile and part of my connection to students. And what would it be that I would talk about? What would it be that I would promote? So I'm very pleased uh, she received her degree on the, I guess it was the November graduation, and just recently received her actual physical diploma. And so she sent me a tweet on her own graduation day. She had her ceremony in Ireland with some friends. She gave a speech. She, she also had sent me images of her holding her diploma. So, but she tweeted all of that, because that's who she is. And that was um, very interesting. Another thing, this leads to this one. I was asked by some graduate students in my ARA division. I'm in Division J. And the grad students wanted to do uh, a chat. They have a, a periodic chat four times a year. The topic was internationalization. They asked if I would do it, and I agreed. And so I had to learn how to do a chat on Twitter. And so I found TweetDeck, played with that, um, began to understand how you keep track of multiple conversations happening at the same time in this very intense hour on Friday, just sitting there hoping I could type fast enough and communicate well enough and speaking with many, many students. I also created a, a bibliography on internationalization that is different than the way internationalization is typically discussed in my field. It's, it's typically a how-to or how would you type of question. And my questions are what in the heck are we doing type of questions. So it was a very subversive um, kind of, of bibliography wanting to try to bring some of these critical questions into the dialogue. And the analytics from SlideShow, this is the so I, I posted the slides to this um, online environment called SlideShare and then tweeted the URL of the slide deck. And the number of hits I had that day was uh, nearing 250. And then over a period of time, it drops off really you know, sharply. But um, 169 from the US, 83 from Canada, and then some from France and the Philippines and Japan. So it, it gets out there in a way that I don't have that type of normal reach. It's just a, not, I'm not an online person in that way. I've also been looking at some, some uh, really interesting surprises and enjoying uh, establishing research networks and collaborations uh, and scholarly net networks over Twitter. So on the far there, right there, my friend Alma Maldonado Maldonado, she's at um, UNAM in Mexico. and. She, she tweets, I think, at least 50 or 60 times a day. She acknowledges that she has an issue. <laughs> Most of them are in Spanish, which challenges me to uh, try to read them. And, uh, and then occasionally, she and I will have conversations about things in my bad Spanish English. And so it's been great, because I don't get to see her very much. She's, she's in Mexico City. Um, research uh, groups like HEDA, HEDA is a, a group of scholars and students in Norway. I had a visiting appointment there several years ago. So connecting with them again is really, really nice. Ashley, down at the end here, we met on Twitter. So, um, so new people, it's really nice. And then my friend David Hoffman from Finland, he and I don't get to see each other very much either, so it's nice just to uh, occasionally see something from him. One of my conferences that I go to annually is the Association for the Study of Higher Education. They have been for quite some time been very active on Twitter, and I just kind of just ignored it. I, I really did not care, didn't have time for that, wasn't interested. But this year I thought, I'm going to try this. What is this thing? And, and this association actually at the, um, the front desk of, of the meeting, they have, have three big screen TVs that just constantly roll the tweets with the hashtag of the conference. So you can see that this is something that the the association itself is very interested in. And what I and looking over those um, the transcripts basically of the tweets after the conference, it was really fascinating to me to see how sub 
hashtags emerged. So gay ash was the one that emerged out of conversations that happened in the hallways. And then when you follow the hashtag gay ash, you began to see these are conversations that we don't normally have in a formal public space. And, and it's time to. So it, it's, it's these ways that, that certain things emerge through people's conversations and then they put them into public, um, uh, public places like social media. And this was a, a panel that I was involved in. And it was sort of back and forth. I was trying to live tweet it. I was, I was very bad at it. But I tried to live tweet it as my pan fellow panelists were speaking and um, reading tweets then that other people were saying about our, our uh, session while it was in progress. And that was fascinating and frightening at the same time. Another area that I, I'm, if I'm going to do this, I want to do this part of it intentionally and purposefully and also carefully is to see how we might use Twitter for a certain type of public advocacy and activism. So some of it's kind of just on the borders of passive, right? So a tweet comes by that I find important and I retweet it. That's, that's hardly any uh, big act on my part. But then there's other times when there's conversations that I feel really need to be discussed, really need to be put on the day's agenda for people. You know, we, we need to stop what we're doing and we need to talk about this today, not tomorrow. And so I've been trying to figure out ways that that might work. And it's, it's challenging to, I think, I think really you, to do this well, you need to leverage it with other social media. So Twitter itself isn't going to do it. But it, it may surface some types of conversations and put them into your networks in a way that um, is somewhat disruptive. I won't give it like, full credit for being life-changing. But it's so, it can be somewhat disruptive. The problem is I think our spaces are very safe spaces, academic spaces. There isn't enough controversy in our spaces. So people are kind of business as usual most of the day. Um, this is an interesting area, too, that I'd like to do more research on. And keeping current with events and news, this happens just most of our um, academic Twitter accounts are relatively promotional in that sense, that they're going to be promoting uh, things that you might do, um, news of the day, uh, public relations type material. But there's an opportunity, I, I, I hope anyway, I'm trying to see how we might do it, to have sort of a, a post-structural bent on that, and to take a topic that seems to be getting a lot of play for the day, and then in a very short amount of words, critique it, or disturb it, or deconstruct it in some way. So a couple weeks ago, there was a conversation happening in, in my field about the, particularly in the US, about the Carnegie Credit Hour Unit. And there was this expectation that a particular report that Carnegie was going to do might provide another way for us to measure time spent in class, or time spent on topic for educational assessment, and kind of organizing higher education coursework. And that things like a MOOC or things like online learning would, um, more broadly, might have an effect on how we think about credit hours. But the report basically reinforced what has already happened for a very long period of time. So I thought, and I was reading it to my daughter, Alice in Wonderland, and I thought, that's very interesting. That is exactly what we talked about. So the reason they're called lessons is because they lesson from day to day. So thinking about credit hours, it's not like you start out at three, and maybe by the time you've done it, it's worth one or zero, right? So why do we use the three-hour credit hour? There's also quite a bit of, those of you that are on Twitter at UBC, this is a very Twittering kind of place. Um, lots of units tweet about what's happening in their day-to-day their, uh, -day activities. But for me, it's also a, a place for me to know when things are happening that I might want to go to that... I, I just may not have been aware enough to, to realize. Um, or things that I'm anticipating, right? I've been waiting for this exhibit at MOA to come out for, for weeks and weeks, and finally it's out, right? So finally it's available. And seeing how people react to that, there was a lot of, of uh, Twitter communication about this, um, this exhibit. And 
as I started with this, this discussion, I'm, I'm interested in, as a unit of analysis research, I'll just show you a couple things. So these are not my tweets. These are tweets that I might use as data. So these are images from UBC promoting the place and the space and the look of UBC. You generally see positive things being shown in, in these types of tweets. There's a, a saying in, in this type of research that you never see a campus on a rainy day. And part of it is because you don't want your camera to get ruined. But on the other hand, it's also because there's a, there's a, a, a thing about images of campuses and how they act in the world, how they are recruiting tools, how they are promotional, how they are aspirational, how they are nostalgic, how they reinforce traditions, lots of different things. So I'm interested in those types of actions that universities are taking. I'm analyzing uh, official website, or no, I'm sorry, official tweet profiles, Twitter profiles of Canadian universities. And I'll just show you a couple of these. So this is Toronto. Um, and and what's, what's really exciting about this research is that there, everything's a moving target. There's not a single day that you can expect your research subject to be the same. And so even even in the sort of document analysis kind of way, these are these are evolving um, amorphous virtual spaces. And so tomorrow this may look entirely different. And and that's part of what is that's part of the part of the analysis. There's a researcher that I follow named Jillian Rose and she does she's a methodologist for visual studies and she talks about, she's revising her visual methodologies book, and she's talking on Twitter and on her blog about adding another mode of analysis, which is the communicative mode, communication mode. So how are images communicated? And she's very interested in social media and the impossibility of capturing a whole population of data. There's there's no way you could, you could say, I've I have all the tweets that the University of Toronto has ever tweeted, or all the tweets in the world that mention the University of Toronto. Not possible. So then what? And that's fascinating too from a methodological standpoint. So just to show you a few of these, so this is Queens, Yukon. You can see they're all very different public persona. And this is just a few days ago. Um, Alberta and Saskatchewan. Oh, sorry, Saskatoon. And so um, you can see that the, this one is very similar to the idea of, of the Toronto one, where instead of one image, you have this compilation of student images or images of students. And so there's this idea of, of some universities are more interested in, the, in this than others, grabbing onto the idea that students are making the brand at the same time that the institution wants to have control over the brand. And um, that's, that's interesting to me. Finally, I'm adding humor. So I have a, a new colleague named Sam Rocha. Some of you may have met him. He's hysterical. He, his office is right next to mine, but we communicate more regularly on Twitter, and mainly because he tweets a lot. Um, and we have conversations back and forth that way, and it's, it's just funny. Um, so sometimes you just need to have a little bit of levity in this life, right, in this academic space. So it's interesting to see how, how, where I feel comfortable with that, and sort of revealing some of my, my uh, myself publicly in that way. I have some references here. I'm happy to email this this uh, presentation to you. I've also already posted it to SlideShare, so you can Google it and find it. Um, there's there's quite a bit of interesting um, work. A lot of it is in the sociometrics world because they're interested in how Twitter references can be used in citation analysis and impact analysis. So that to me is the unit of analysis, not so much what I want to do with it. So, uh, so but some, some recent work here in these different journals. Thank you. So thank you for having me today here to talk about my research, which is on um, young people's media literacy practices in the context of international development and education. Um, as we know from the previous presentations, there's been an exponential rise in the access to participatory media. Um, and with that, there's 
both a number of organizations who are using media to work with young people around issues of empowerment, um, and also a research trend that really celebrates media participation um, and media literacy in participatory networks. So my work documents how power dynamics are articulated in media literacy spaces and programs with instead of a focus on agency or empowerment, moving towards a focus on mobility so that we can better get at some of the power dynamics. Um, I do this in order to address how it is that young media makers negotiate agency and civic engagement in media literacy programming and how videos that are produced by young people are shaped by beliefs about agency, empowerment, and literacy held by educational institutions and um, that are held in transnational networks. So the framework that I'm working with is um, post-structural feminist theory, looking at media networks and pedagogy, and I'm also working with a body of work around democratic practice and the role of media in democratization. So the goal of um, this work is to intervene in the conflation of multiliteracy benefits with agency, particularly uh, in youth media programming that's concerned with social justice. So that issue in those youth media programs that are concerned with social justice is a focus on civic engagement, where civic engagement is understood as the ability to do media participation with the intention of intervening in publics or causing social change, um, where participation or media literacy is conflated with agency. And that focus on agency um, stems from a very modernist account of how it is that change happens and of democratic practice. It really depends on the sovereign subject or a rational subject who can control action. And I'm working with an understanding of democratic practice that comes out of feminist theory that more depends on the struggle over meaning and that did not doesn't work with a, any kind of concept of the rational subject. Uh, so these very many communication for social change programs that are run by international development agencies where young people are making media really depend on a notion of agency that assumes um, that kind of modernist notion of agency that assumes that um, change can be orchestrated through very carefully constructed communicative interventions. So in my project, I'm looking at how transnational constellations of power shape the conditions of possibility in a youth media literacy program um, in rural Nicaragua. I carried out a two-year um, qualitative study on this program called Amigos that runs in rural Nicaragua. Amigos is an organization that brings together young people from North and Latin America. They live and work in pairs of two or three in rural um, communities in Latin America for a couple of months each summer, and they do small-scale development work together. I designed and led this program in Nicaragua that focused on media literacy, where young people were making social justice videos and doing videos on social issues that, that were important to them. So of course, as I was also the director of this program, um, there was lots of challenges and implications regarding my research, regarding what I was able to understand as a white woman doing development work in Latin America, um, and also those relationships certainly enabled me to do this research at all. Um, so it's global, multi-sided, qualitative work. The, one of the goals was to be able to connect really local experiences of video production with transnational networks and to transnational networks and to understand the relationship between local media experiences and transnational networks. Um, certainly the focus is on the visual and I had a lot of visual data to work with um, in addition to interviews and kind of working sessions where young people were producing media together. I'm not going to show any videos today because they're in Spanish and because they're, they'll take up all the time. Um, so young people produce on very, like all kinds of topics, very many. They made videos about the environment, about education, um, they looked at migration, indigeneity, all kinds of different topics um, depending on what they were interested in and what was important to them. And I want to highlight just one instance in which a group of youth um, reproduced pop culture for civic engagement. So there was a group of youth in a community called Los Limones who um, remixed Disney's Pocahontas. And they were in a critical media literacy program, so I was a bit surprised when they first um, made this video. They, but when I looked at it a little bit closer, um, what actually happened is the Nicaraguan young people really wanted to make a video about race. There was a popular um, soap opera on at the time that was about a biracial couple. And the youth were really interested in that, and they saw that they were in this biracial friendship with the Amigos volunteers, and they wanted to 
work with that idea. Um, so as they're having this conversation and trying to figure out what they were going to produce together, one of the American kids says, oh, that sounds like Pocahontas. Let's make that. Um, the uh, Nicaraguan youth had never seen Pocahontas, so then he goes on goes into this in-depth explanation of Pocahontas, Disney's Pocahontas. Um, and they, no animosity, they went off and made, produced Pocahontas. Um, and I think what we see in that story is the way that young people are drawing on various transnational frameworks and various pop cultural references in order to understand race. So you have the Nicaraguan youth thinking about the soap opera that's on, you have the American youth then reframing his peers conversation about race and the soap opera through his own cultural reference point for race, which happens to be Pocahontas, which is significant mostly because Pocahontas is a a colonial story about rape and conquest that was retold by Disney to be a story of multiculturalism. So um, it is then significant that he used that multicultural Disney Pocahontas story in order to frame his peers' um, stories about race. And you can see here in this quote, I am asking him, you know, well, how did you pick Pocahontas? Oh, I don't know, I've never seen it. Um, and he talks about wanting to do something about race, and then one of the volunteers saying, oh, it sounds like Pocahontas, let's do that. Um, so they made this Pocahontas video in the context of this civic engagement, media literacy, critical literacy program. And while they're, they produced together, and the same youth would talk about the video, um, the American young people really drew on participatory language that was very present in the design of the program to describe the video and to talk about it as a video produced by the local youth. Um, you see in the green, Lalo, an American volunteer, says that the young people were able to write this amazing story and they come up with all their ideas. They did not write the story. Um, they were referencing something else and then it was remediated again by the volunteers. Um, while the Nicaraguan young people are like, oh no, that was the Amigos volunteer story. They had to make a bunch of videos and this is one of them. And I, want to clarify that it's not as though if they had if they had not reproduced something from popular media that they might have produced a story that was more authentic but rather there there are no authentic stories um, and they, these kinds of examples from pop culture where we can really see and trace back how they're drawing on various stories illustrate um, that kind of remediation and that kind of false authenticity that is then relied upon when we read stories as voice or as empowerment by young people um, so even though we can see how this story is traced, can be traced back to Disney, there's a real insistence on naming it as youth voice. And I think what's really troubling about that is the way that assumptions about the lives of Nicaraguan youth become then fixed to pop culture narratives that have already been redrawn in particularly racist, gendered kinds of colonial ways, um, and then are read by the nonprofit because we need to make our programs work and we read our, our young people's media pieces in particular ways as youth voice. Um, so clearly what would be very problematic about thinking about Pocahontas through that kind of agency lens that talks about the story as youth voice would be that we would miss the way that young people are drawing on transnational mediascapes and the negotiation of meaning in their production practice. So how it is that they negotiated that story and um, who played a role there and how, how that really came to be. I think that what is helpful instead of using that kind of agency um, emancipatory lens is thinking about their practice, their media production practice through a mobilities lens that accounts for how young people move through these stories and draw on transnational mediascapes in order to tell what are unique stories but have elements of um, other narratives that they're familiar with. So I would argue for mobilities as a framing concept for youth media literacy and participation because it accounts for those kinds of complexities of power and it accounts for how it is that young people navigate and remediate media literacy practices, stories, spaces, um, in order to participate in our educational initiatives or digital education initiatives. Um, certainly, media literacy programming like this offers unparalleled, um, very important young opportunities for young people to come together across radical difference and for young people to do global engagement. And I, I would say that at the end of this project, I'm hopeful that if we're able to situate youth media literacy programming in relation to ideas about mobility and to rethink um, what it is that young people do, are doing in ways that are not emancipatory, um, we can move away from conflating all of the 
many and important multiliteracy benefits of media production with agency to focus on relational mobility in media literacy as a hopeful way to frame youth engagement with storytelling and social media. Thank you. Some of the others have shared their uh, own research. I'm going to talk a little bit more in general about uh, researching um, social media, uh, drawing on a couple of the projects I've worked on. Um, and I've called this, It's Not Ethnography If You Don't Live in a Tent. Um, that was actually a quote that someone said to me when I said, well, I'm doing a digital ethnography. And they said, well, how, how can it be ethnography if you're online? Um, you, you have to live in a tent and live with these people. You can't live online. Um, and so that kind of threw up me a, bit, a very big problematic uh, conception of social media research. Um, and there's another voice that comes up quite a bit when talking about it, and it's this idea um, of, of big data. And social media, it just gives us data and numbers, and that's really all that matters. Um, and I see those as, as really sort of equally uh, problematic views that really draw on outdated ideas of, of what media and social media are. Um, so I'm kind of hoping to address some of those views uh, in the next few minutes. Um, so my background, um, I started sort of researching social media around 2007, 2008, and my master's degree was on Facebook in the lives of postgraduate students. And that was sort of when Facebook was first coming out, and I looked at uh, the impact it was having on their sort of academic lives and the social support networks they were developing. Um, it was just a very small study, uh, but kind of an interesting one that did a lot of sort of virtual ethnography online and went in and did interviews with participants sitting in front of their Facebook profiles um, and talking, talking me through it. Um, so it was interesting and, and you know, not unexpectedly, Facebook wasn't doing much about academics, but it was doing a lot about social support. Um, and now I'm looking at uh, threshold concepts in connectivist MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Um, this is going to be my PhD research. Um, so I'm looking more at um, the idea of, of learning in connectivist spaces. So, so how are ideas of learning and knowledge changing in a world where we're now connected to information and connected to each other? Um, and again, it's, it's a sort of ethnographic study where I'm following people as they go through a course called um, RISO 50, and this is sort of a picture from last year's iteration of this course on, on rhizomatic knowledge. Um, so that's sort of my background. Why study social media? I know a lot of people kind of just look at social media as, as maybe a bit of a, a fad or a flash in the pan, something for the kids, and why should we be interested? Um, this is a fairly recent uh, breakdown of some of the social media tools that are out there and the different uh, use by different people in different generations. Um, and there's massive engagement with social media, I think we know that, and it's, and it's increasing in, in all ages. So it's not just something kids do um, on the side, and it's also becoming really part of their learning. So we're no longer seeing learning just as in school, but more informal. A lot of that informal learning comes through and around social networks. Um, and it also is a new space to sort of gather a very different type of data and get a window into sort of a different part of the world of people who use social media. Um, there's also some why nots. So some people are kind of jump on the bandwagon of social media, um, and that's also sort of very troublesome. Uh, a lot of people say, well, it's, it's out there, it's an easy place to get data, so I'll research social media. Um, and others focus really on the, the technology. You know, well, I'm just going to focus on, on Twitter or YouTube without thinking of sort of what's going on behind it. You know, why is it having the impact it is, not just is it having the impact. Um, you, we also have to keep in mind that, that this sort of things change so quickly that often if you're doing a sort of long-term study, um, what you start out with in terms of, of what Twitter looks like by the end may look very different. So there's this idea that you have to keep on changing with the uh, technology. Um, and there's also often a cultural clash and, and maybe a generational clash also between uh, a lot of academics and a lot of participants on social media where they just don't understand, there's, there's not that understanding of what the social media space is and I think that sort of scares people off or they go into studying social media without understanding that difference um, which can be quite a problem. So I was going to talk through um, a few of the challenges that I've run into and that others have run into um, and a lot of them come down to this idea that at the same time that you're studying social media and, and what is going on on social media, you're also using it as a research tool. So you're studying through social media. Um, and, and those two things can sometimes conflict with each other. So some of the big problems, um, so defining the site of research for social media can be really problematic. Um, social media is very, what goes on, on social media is very fluid. Uh, it moves from one space to another quite quickly. 
Um, and, and it changes. And I think as, as Amy pointed out with you know, the University of Toronto's Twitter page, that changes all the time. It's very hard to study something that's constantly moving. Um, with these research methods, especially from the past, that sort of tend to take a snapshot and try to freeze things. Uh, also, social media is very fragmentary, so tweets are 140 characters, Facebook posts are short, brief YouTube videos, and really, how do you construct a story or construct an understanding out of these brief little bits of information that often go from platform to platform to platform? Um, as well, the idea that somebody who has an identity on one platform uh, may have a completely different identity on another platform, and so it's hard to trace a person from one to the other. One of the other problems is, is the idea of big data, like there's so much out there, and that is uh, stats of what goes on on the internet in one second. Um, yeah, so, and that's, you know, just part of it. So there's so much data generated, um, so you have to really figure out how you're going to study it. Uh, there's some, one of the, the massive online courses I study, um, they capture, every time somebody goes onto that course, every keystroke is captured and output into a data file, and you could have that data file um, to deal with. So you need new ways of dealing with this information. You know, it's not, it, uh, the, the old statistical methods really sort of aren't <coughs> cutting it. Um, also, the information is really multimodal. There's text, there's video, there's you know, remix digital storytelling. There's all these different things that you have to deal with that can be a real challenge when you're trying to research this stuff. Methods and methodologies kind of change as you get online. A lot of things we are taking online, and a lot of people seem to be sort of scared of the idea of using more traditional approaches in online spaces, um, but really they do translate quite well. Um, one of the ideas is digital ethnography or virtual ethnography, online ethnography has been around for quite a while. So there's a lot of uh, literature out there on it, uh, a lot of talking about how it can move into these spaces. At the same time, new uh, methods are developing. Um, this picture is a social network visualization. I think it's lovely, I don't understand it at all. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out you know, how we're using these new methods, how we're gonna make sense of them, and how we're gonna share the data so that other researchers can also understand. Um, I put up the trap of simplicity. Research, a lot of the research, especially around education and, and learning online, um, relies on surveys, because it's so easy to sh throw a survey up online and you know, ask people to fill it out, and then boom, you've got data. And uh, some, some are very well done, but a lot really aren't. Um, and it's really paying attention to the methods that you're using and how they do translate into these online spaces to be very you know, strong methods. Um, and ideas of validity that go along with that. So something like survey research, again, uh, when you're studying um, the mass open online courses that I am, if you get three to seven percent response rate, it's actually really good. So these whole ideas of, of people reading these studies and saying that doesn't seem valid really have to be rethought in terms of social media. Um, and the final one I put up here, which kind of everybody touches on, is, is the idea of ethics. Um, many of you probably remember a Facebook thing that came out in the summer, uh, a lot of uh, backlash towards the study Facebook did where they posted, uh, choose what, chose what posts went onto your timeline in order to try to manipulate emotions. Um, and the real backlash against, you know, is that ethical? Uh, and looking through Facebook's um, terms of service, which no one ever reads, it actually did end up being, they said they had the right to do it. Is it ethical is another question. Um, but some of the big things that come up, and, and these are not just around research, but often around social media in general, the idea of, of what is public and what is private, and how can we decide if something is a public space where we can just go and observe versus a private space. Um, UBC's ethics says if you need a, a login, that it's a private space, but there's so many sites now that you know ask you to sign in with Facebook or Google or something that that definition is going to have to start changing again. Um, and you know who owns who owns a Facebook group? You know, do you have to get everybody's you know consent on that, or is that a semi-private space? There's a lot of these questions sort of come up, as well as the idea of, of owning data. Um, and in education, in, in the MOOC research I'm doing, like who owns all that data of of, of what student types of the student? Is it the platform? Is it the professor who's running the course? You know, where, where eventually does this, this end up and who can use it? Um, similarly, uh, ideas of anonymity. So in a world where you can Google search anything, what does it mean to be anonymous? You know, it used to be if, if you took somebody's tweet and you just took their name off it, that was fine. But now if you put that tweet into Google, it'll very quickly tell you who tweeted that. Um, and there was another case I, I saw recently of uh, sort of an anonymized data set around um, health care options and what people chose from healthcare, where they said, you know, we take off any identifying data, 
but uh, they were able to identify the health records of the governor of Massachusetts, some media outlet found him, just through uh, zip code and date of birth and gender. So all these things come up as questions. Um, informed consent is another big one. How do you get informed consent from you know, 400 people on a Facebook group? Or everybody who's ever tweeted um, about the University of British Columbia. Like, how on earth can you go about getting signed informed consent? And, and in a lot of ways, you know, you just you just can't. So ideas around that really have to be rethought. Um, and the final one I put up there is the terms of service that goes with each social media platform, which is different. Which is what can you, as a researcher, do on that platform? What can you take from it? Um, and it changes from platform to platform and from country to country. So when you're researching online, you know you, you don't really have a way of knowing always where a person is living. So what what rules apply to them? You know, what, what, how is that different from from where you are? So there's a huge you know thing around around ethics that come up. Um, and I was going to quickly share kind of what I've learned so far. Um, so good research practices, whether they're offline or online, are the same. You know, paying attention to ethics, thinking about you know involving your participants which methods match what you're trying to find out, being very, you know, reflexive and, and sharing your results openly. Focusing on the question, not the technology, not the theory, not the method you want to use, but really focusing on what you want to know about these online spaces. Um, understanding the space and the norms that are there, participating in it, and understanding why people talk in the way they do on, on Twitter, or, you know, what it is about a Facebook group space that's really developed a community. Being flexible and this idea of, of developing new methods and thinking sort of outside the box of changing as you go or changing traditional practices to really get at the data you want. Um, collecting multiple types of data, often because of this fragmentary nature, so a lot of people use uh, sort of the idea of timelines and so if they're following one person, my research follows about 15 different participants um, I, and we have a timeline of, of what comes from where, so what is you know, data collected or screen captured, what they've done in interviews, what comes from logged files, to put it all together into a like, coherent picture. Um, and drawing on others, and that's something that Amy touched on, is, is this idea of developing a network of scholars, which is also really, really well done with social media, um, to be able to ask others and to share your research and to draw on the expertise that is out there. Um, so that's basically a very quick overview of, uh, of yeah, research on social media. So thank you.